I'm Eric Chemi, and this is Politely Pushy. Doug and Jamie, I'm so excited to chat with you today about your new book, Make Work Better. I love that we have both of you on with me at the same time. You wrote the book together. So it's a lot of teamwork. It's a lot of the theme here, right? How do we work in companies better? How, how do we do this as a team and not sort of let people go adrift, not set them up to fail? So you know, we've got the CEO, we've got the head of HR, we've got two C-suite executives here with their different perspectives. And in my you know notes and preparation, on this, it struck me about how everybody hates the performance management process. And yet we continue to do it anyway, even though we know that we hate it. So I don't know if that's a question. Maybe I'll say to Jamie as the you know running HR organizations, talking to HR leaders across the country, why do they keep doing it if we know that this is not good for anybody? Oh, that's such a good question. And and one that we are constantly in conversations with, with our customers and prospects, the notion that why would you continue to do something that, I mean, it is universal, universally well known within HR folks that um, this is probably the biggest complaint uh, issue that employees and managers will have. So why don't we? Well, I, there is, you know, the big element I would say is about the change that you're asking organizations to make, uh, which is why we take change management really seriously at BetterWorks. The notion that this is not just um, an idea of uh, moving from twice a year conversation to multiple conversations throughout the year. Uh, lightweight, much more conversational feedback, all of that piece, um, that that creates a big change for an organization. Uh, but as well, it's this, this idea that, you know, we also have to do a much better job in HR of supporting our managers and how effective they are at being coaches. So there's a few things that, that require HR people to maybe take a, a pause before they do it. And we're here to tell them, be bold, go for it. And just to get this, I I saw Doug, Doug was about to say something, so go for it. Eric, I was just going to add, I think the other thing that I've experienced is that there's a lot of downstream processes tied to the annual review, largely compensation. And so because they're so tied together, they don't, they can't figure out how to untie them and go to something that is done lightweight quarterly versus once a year or twice a year in the old process. And uh, and the other thing we're trying to do is flip this whole process on its ear and make it about not something that HR is driving in an organization, but what an individual contributor actually sees as a value to them because they're having meaningful conversations with their managers about their careers and their goals that they're trying to accomplish in their companies. And, and I certainly know that experience where you're filling it out usually in December, it's like November, December, you're filling it out. Like, what did you do this year? And it's like, you write the stuff down from October, November, and December, and you've completely forgotten what you did the first nine months exactly. of the year. And so many people where it's, I really got to send a bunch of emails and do a bunch of meetings and put a big project out in November, December, because that's when they're deciding my bonus and my raise, even if I didn't really do all that much the first nine months of the year. So you're both nodding because you know, right? That's that's how these things are certainly gamed. But I just want to get out of the way because someone's going to ask, somebody watching, somebody listening right now is like, okay, but what are they selling? They've got the book, but they're selling their thing, right? So let's just get out of the way, differentiating what you're selling versus what's in the book and and how maybe those overlap, but maybe how, not necessarily how the book is like, this is just a general thing that we want people to understand. Yeah, so, so Eric, we're a software as a service application, enterprise application. And what we've spent the last 10 years doing is trying to reinvent the performance process around something that meets the needs of today's workforce. So inside the application, we basically have given you a roadmap of capabilities that lets you do many of the things that you actually might be doing outside of your performance process today. So uh, one-on-one, so you can touch base with your employees on kind of the tactical things they're working on. We have a conversational tab that we use in quarterly check-ins uh, of the important part of our app, uh, application as well as is a goal-setting application. So, you know, what we like companies to do is to sit down on a quarterly basis, top uh, have the top company goals uh, exposed to the organization, 
And then everybody looks up at those top company goals and sits with their manager and say, well, if that's what the company's trying to accomplish, what are the two or three or four most important things I should be working on to help the company attain, attain its goals? And then also a conversation with the manager about, well, who would you like to be in the organization? I, as the manager, how can I help you get there? So let's set some goals around you personally too and your personal development. And then we have things like uh, feedback and recognition in, in real time, not giving you feedback once a year. Uh, you know, you were just in a meeting and I want to give you some lightweight feedback and say nice job and make you feel good and maybe recognize you inside our application there as well. We're also reinventing things like calibration or the nine block process that large organizations do. So it's a very capable application aimed at lightweight. The only thing I would add is this notion of in the flow of work. So Doug was talking about all these different exchanges that happen. Um, and if you think about the traditional performance management, you know, twice a year, typically, so once it, you know, it's mid year and year end um, between an employee and their manager. But it's also, uh, if you think about traditional applications for this, it's a different portal. So it's, the employee and the manager have to get out of what they're doing. And once or twice a year, they move into a different system to, as you said, you know, try and remember all the things that they, you know, uh, have done over the course of the last year. So what BetterWorks has done is it embeds itself in all of the activity or all of the applications that an employee or a manager is doing through, you know, in their working day, whether that's Teams or Outlook or Gmail, et cetera. And it allows then for you to have your entire body of work tr tracked and, and uh, captured by BetterWorks so that instead of pondering about, oh gosh, you know, what can I write on my my performance review in you know January or in December, um, I actually can see all the feedback recognition conversations that I've had throughout the year. Um, again, uh, removing some of the friction in the process. I, I hear that phrase, the, oh, your your Outlook or your email. And we're tracking it. I hear that and all of a sudden I'm like, oh, I don't know if I want all of this being tracked. <laughs> how, does, how does that work when you when you go to companies and, and you offer that idea? Well, no, it's Eric, Eric, Eric's the notion of um, of going into better works and maybe setting your goals. And then now you can leave better works. And now I'm living as a CEO. I'm I'm quite a bit inside of Gmail. Well, we have a panel on the right hand side of Gmail and integration with it so that if I make progress to a goal, I don't have to leave and go back to BetterWorks. I can just click on the right panel and give an, up, an update that I have made progress on this goal, or I could give somebody feedback. But the important part that Jamie was talking about, well, so now maybe I'm preparing for a quarterly conversation where I'm going to go into the application. The employee's already gone into the application and said, here's what I did. Here's some of the roadblocks I hit. I, I attained this goal. I missed this goal. Well, when I'm going in to give them feedback, I have all of their information right in front of me so that I'm not using my memory bias to give them feedback. It's all right there as I give them the feedback that I want to give them on, on what they told me about what they accomplished. Jamie, when you were writing the book, how much were you surprised? What did you learn? What was it like? Oh, I didn't actually know this before because there's so many books that we all know, the business books where we read it, we're like, I already knew all that. This is kind of standard stuff, but you're trying to bring something new, obviously, when you write the book. So what, what was it that that you were surprised about in your own learning journey? Uh, well, I guess a couple of things. Um, one, it's just really interesting to not have the HR funnel over my head. So the idea that Doug and I were writing this together had sort of, we have a, a, a yin-yang brain uh, collectively. So uh, you know, I, I come to conversations, whether, you know, about this topic from an HR perspective, clearly. Uh, so it was really interesting for me to hear Doug's uh, perspective as well. Uh, so I would say that's the first thing. And I think another thing that was a fun fact that was uncovered when we were doing research is that the performance management review process was invented like a hundred years ago. It feels like it's part of that whole industrial work revolution of like the turn of the century in 1900. It does. It has that like factory kind of feel. It, it, totally. And so, you know, I mentioned change before and, and the notion of the transformation that has to occur. That's a big jump, right? That's a big jump from hierarchical top down uh, industrial era to the idea that, you know, all of the humans that show up in an organization want to thrive. 
and what are we doing to get things out of the way, including old archaic processes like performance management? How, how are we removing the noise from those systems so that people can thrive um, and not be thwarted? The, the idea that the workforce isn't as hierarchical, I know you, you mentioned that, I saw that when I was preparing, but I don't know if I believe that. Help me walk through it. Like when Doug is the CEO or Jamie's like head of, you know, chief HR officer or whatever, VP, like in different roles that you've had, you have all led departments or entire organizations. You probably don't want to hear, oh, it's not that hierarchical because you're the boss, right? Like, and, and you need everyone to listen to what you're saying. And so I struggle with that because I still look to the boss and I've always had a boss. So how do you... And maybe I'm old. Maybe that's the difference between <laughs> me and, and someone who's in their 20s now, where it's like, oh, no, we don't have anything. But I struggle with that idea. Help walk me through how the world's not no, as hard. Eric, I'd, I'd, I would say, I'd say it this way. For, for one, you know, one of the roles in my past is uh, I was running a very large sales organization for Cisco Systems. I had 6,000 employees. And over the course of, of my career at Cisco, we went from probably eight layers or nine layers in the organization and compressed that down to five um, because things get lost in when, when you have that much hierarchy. Uh, and I'd also say that individuals today probably spend the least amount of time with their manager. They're spending time on teams. Uh, they're driving organizational you know, programs ahead inside the organization. And, and to be an effective manager, you really have to spend time understanding where that person spent time and getting feedback from all those teams that that person spent time on. And, and again, we're, we're trying to flip this thing to a different conversation. It's not how did you perform? We believe it's more about enablement. So let's you and I agree on what you're going to get done. And then let's talk about were, were you able to achieve what you said you're going to achieve? And if you didn't, did we have the wrong goal? Did we, did, was it you know, too aspirational? We couldn't get there. Was there roadblocks that I can help remove for you? So we really tried to change the conversation to be something that's more lightweight and team oriented versus what did your manager say about your performance? And there, there's so much politics. Like I, I have a friend that works at a big tech company and he said, oh, the review is based on how good and politically connected your boss is and it doesn't matter how good you were and then what were you on the right project but you're not in charge of which project you're on and and there's so much that's out of his control and so he sort of feels like what well, why am i even working harder because exactly. it's it, nothing i can do about this right exactly. he's thwarted he's thwarted so I, I would i would say you know um and he's probably looking for other positions in other firms for the exact same reason right uh, so no surprise if, if folks don't feel like um, they are being uh, supported well and that their that their boss or supervisor or whoever is has their back and is helping them get uh, getting getting obstacles out of their way, um, people are going to vote with their vote with their feet. Um, and I think that's just what we're starting to see. You know, you asked it originally. Uh, the notion of the boss employee relationship. Well, I think things have changed. So may maybe Eric, you are old. <laughs> <laughs> because because the I can promise you uh, that is not uh, employees have a completely different expectation now. They are expecting that the people that they work with are going to be giving them consistent uh, feedback, uh, that they're going to be helping them, that they are helping them in not only achieve what they're, you know, their business goals are, but also what their career goals are. So the conversations changed. We've just not universally moved to the process to support that. Yeah, I would too also say, Eric, leadership is no longer about me telling you what to do, you know, command and control, right, right? especially in this environment we're in now. It's very empathetic driven. You have got to be invested in understanding what's going on in these per your, your employees' lives, how it's you know, affecting their work and being invested in helping them achieve. You know, we, we, I'm all, uh, this whole book is around moving away from, you know, your point, the traditional performance management process is, do I like you or don't I like you? And, and which is ridiculous. You might be a really great performer, but my personality clashes with you. Right. Therefore, I'm going to give you negative feedback. Right. If you just swapped, if you had swapped bosses or swapped employees, everyone would do better because they'd have a personality click. And, exactly. it, and there'd be nothing to do about their actual work. And the other thing that happens inside of something like what we do, Eric, is 
there's complete transparency throughout the organization. So everybody can see everybody's goals and see how they're doing against their goals and how are am I, geez, are my goals right? Because when I look over here, they're doing something way different than I'm doing. And then it's, and it's also creates an, a, a transparent culture, right? I mean, everybody knows what everybody else is up to. And, and I bet some companies don't want that though. I'm sure there are still some control focused executives that say, I don't want that kind of transparency. I don't want to be this, able to- You can mark them as private, Eric. So there can be public and private goals. And I think in a public company, sometimes, you know, you're going to set financial goals that have to be made private. Right. But for the most part, we try, you know, most companies now that use our software are rethinking that their culture needs to change from what it was to something different. And they work with us to do that, that change management process. In the process of writing the book, how did you two work together? And did it, did it bring up your own thoughts of, huh? Like maybe, maybe yeah. my approach to work is different because now I'm, I'm a real world guinea pig in this project. Well, let me tell you how we set it up and then I'll have Jamie answer that question. We came at this from two different directions. So, I, you know, when I was at Cisco with a big team, I had a, I had an HR business partner and I probably had five different HR business partners over the course of my career there. And, and I saw the effects of having somebody who really helped me be effective in running this organization versus somebody who was kind of tactically oriented. And then all of a sudden, I left Cisco and I became, you know, the CEO of WebEx post the acquisition. And I've been running SaaS companies since, but now I've been in two companies where we do nothing but build HR software. So I'm the ex-president of Success Factors. And so now I've done nothing but sell progressive HR software to all these enterprises around the world. And so I came at this from looking at it from a e CEO's perspective on how do I make the best culture and processes inside my organization from a good CEO's perspective. Not that I'm not trying to be arrogant about being a good CEO, but, and then Jamie came at this after being 25 years as an operator in HR and came at it from that perspective. And so we came the combined perspective of how do you get people to move off these old antiquated processes and, and tried to create a roadmap of what positivity happens when you do. So then yeah, the only ahead. thing, sir, the only thing I would add there is that, you know, as a, as an HR practitioner, um, I'm, I'm also, if I, you know, if I think about my career, I've always been sort of pulled towards transformation and change and innovation. And I think HR is ripe for uh, that mindset. And so the idea of sort of, uh, of marrying uh, technology, change management and HR is something that, I mean, I just, it's, it's, this is like the, the absolute best place to be a guinea pig. It seems like so much of the issue is less about what did you do for me in the past year, but what are you going to do for me in the next year? Because we never really get to that. It's always, what did you do? Here's your raise or here's your bonus. And then next year, uh, I don't know, just do more of the same thing, but do it a little bit better, right? And it feels like that gets short trip. You're exactly right, Eric. I mean, think about, you know, traditionally HR did an annual performance review, and then they also did compensation at the same time. Well, they got so much pushback, like, oh my God, this is so much work. I can't effectively do my job. They moved the compensation conversation out to mid-year. Well, I, it makes me laugh. Now you're using six months old data to give somebody a compensation increase or decrease. And, and so, you know, we just, it's time to move to something better. And the whole book is around helping people understand that what is the, I mean, we, we, there's eight different, I believe eight different customer stories in the book talking about what's happened to those organizations who were brave enough to make that change. I've heard from one employer who said, oh, I give the bonus at the end of the year, like December, and then I give the raise in July. Like I do this like every six months thing because he said people are motivated for that more money, but that is short-term motivation and that wears off. So you can't just do it all at the end of the year. You got to give them something mid-year. And, and I'm curious, Jamie, from your HR experience and research, how much is the motivation about money versus I need a better work-life balance. I need a manager that cares about me. I need a company that aligns with my goals. It, it often seems, especially nowadays after COVID, money is maybe not even a, a top three factor in a lot of people's situations. Well, and what's interesting, we, we have a report coming, a research report coming out in the next little bit here, um, uh, which which sort of looks at exactly what is motivating folks. And, and while money will be in a, you know one of the usual suspects, I think more and more of what we're seeing is exactly what you're talking about. 
the pandemic gave a lot of people a lot of time globally to sort of sit and prioritize what was truly important for them and what motive, what were their key motivators. And so I think what we're seeing in the data that we've pulled is that the mix up at the top five uh, motivating factors are changing. Um, and, you know, it really does become, is this a, is this a place that I trust? Is, is this a place that I feel included? Is this a place where I have a good, strong relationship with uh, the people that I work with? Um, and is this a place where I understand how what I do, it matters? Are there companies that you talk to that, because everything we've said in a way makes a lot of sense, right? And sometimes when things make too much sense, they make for less exciting podcasts, but when things are too obvious, right? So I'm, I'm curious about some of the conflict, which is, who doesn't agree with this, right? Who who do you go with these ideas and 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 they're just like, no, I like I, I don't buy this. I, I want to stick with hierarchy. I want to stick with the way we've been doing things for a hundred years. I'm sure you've heard that at some point in the last five. We, years. we actually pointed out in the book, Eric, um, and it's it, you know I wish I could put somebody in and, and go through my experiences with me in my career because I when you look at an HR person who is I call a mobilizer. They're at the table. They report to the CEO. They are interested in the business they're in. They're interested in the strategy of that business. And they're thinking, okay, if we need to be here in 10 years skill-wise, what do I need to do to move the organization? They can hold a mirror up to the CEO and say, you know what? Those two people on your management team are not going to get you there and need to do something about it. And then there's HR people that do nothing, but the CEO wants nothing to do with HR. It's, oh my God, all that stuff. And just and, pick and, a benefits plan and move on. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and so you, that's the difference. You have organizations that are old and stodgy and CEOs don't know, boy, if they had a really cool, great HR leader, it would be transformational for them and the companies. The irony is, Eric, I bet, you know, I'm not going to accuse all CEOs of this, but big company CEOs don't even usually do their performance reviews for their direct reports. So they have no idea what the experience is that they're putting their company through with all these crappy old products they're making these. What do they do then? If they're not doing it, is it just that the direct reports to a CEO, they just don't get an annual? Yeah, review? they're like, you know, you're doing fine. You know, it's like they, they, they don't really get a performance review. If they are, probably the HR leaders writing it. Right, right. Or I, I at that level, it's like you either hear and you get the stock plan or you're getting fired. That's right. That's right. Exactly right. But, but what they're not doing is experiencing what they're putting their people through. And they probably ought to sit down and do that because, you know what, millennials are not going to tolerate working for a company where they get talked to once a year about their performance. They're going to go someplace that has new and engaging software like what we do. In the in the book, it, the idea is you, know, you got you got to get rid of the low performers early and then really help help the uh, the strong people succeed, but do that sooner. Right, like make these decisions sooner so we're not having these lingering effects. How early is you know, the right early, right? Because we do see at every company we've all been at, there are low performers and they're there and they last. And sometimes they, they avoid a round of layoffs or that they just, they survive somehow. And we always wonder, well, how are they here? Because everyone else is picking up the slack for them and it hurts morale. Everyone else is trying to do a good job. And there's this one person that somehow gets through. How early does that decision have to be made and executed on? Earlier than they normally do. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but again, Eric, when, when everybody's goals are made transparent, you're seeing who's working and who's not. And, and it can uncover, I used, I used to call them moles. You know, they change jobs internally every you know, year, 16 months, and somehow they get new jobs and they never leave. You know, that, that ex they get exposed inside of the process uh, with an application like ours. And, and you're right, the transparency might even show, actually, you might not think they're doing a good job, but actually they are hitting their goals, right? Yeah. Like their, their personality towards you because you don't work for them or, you know, you just see them there, but actually their goal is different than yours and, and they're accomplishing it. And that's why they stay. Like, it's possible that that could be the solution that people yeah. don't realize. Well, you know, going back to your compensation question, do people stay for money? It's probably not in the, the research says it's not in the top three or four things that are important to an individual. The number one reason people stay in a company or leave a company is the relationship they have with their manager. Their direct their, manager. Their direct manager. Do they care about me? Do they know what I'm doing? Are they an advocate? Are they advocating for me? Do they like me? Do I like them? 
And if that's not there, they're going to go find a new job. And, and the problem is with all of this, and I'll, I'll look at Jamie as, as our HR expert here. So many managers are not in that position because they're good at management or they're good at delegation or they're good at the the skill of leading and, and building a team. They're there because like, oh, well, they were the best employee at the lower level job and now they're in charge of everyone else, but they maybe should not be doing that job. Yeah, I think they call that the Peter principle. Um, and I, I would I would add not only that, but um, we haven't done a great job as HR practitioners uh, shoring up the competency around how to be a good coach, how to have difficult conversations, how to give feedback. Um, so, I mean, it's a call to action as well. Certainly something we take seriously at Better Works is how is it that we can provide the kind of support that allows managers to build that competency over time? And part of it, frankly, is just by frequency. Yes, we give them uh, guides to build that, that ability over time, but it's also about the idea that if, Eric, if you and I are having a conversation twice a year around performance, I'm not gonna get necessarily terribly good at it. If we're talking quarterly and we're having conversations on a quarterly basis, if I'm giving you feedback on, you know, whatever, every two weeks or whatever the case may be, um, I'm going to get more comfortable and therefore frequency builds competency. Yeah, I was just looking, I was just looking at my note, the frequency builds competency. I was just going to say that if you had a, let's say monthly, if you had 10 minutes a month, you would be so much better off than having the nerve wracking episode that is the once a year sit down for an hour that everyone is freaking out about and and you don't even you don't get all those details but if it's like once a month for 10 minutes like just do these things do these three things more of and do these three things less of and do that for the next month that would be i imagine a much better outcome for everybody well eric exactly. I, I, you know i i used the example um my husband and i don't sit down once a year and have a conversation about how we've done <laughs> this these are these are moments that happen on a weekly basis we give each other feedback we give each other recognition we have constructive conversations it's much more the way humans communicate and interrelate uh if you're doing it on a regular basis so our, our average our average user of our application eric is in our product almost every, every seven days not once a year what about the idea of the managers who are nervous about like well i don't want to upset them or this person is sensitive to feedback if i remind them what they did wrong they're just going to stress out or lash out or get mad at me or report me to hr for saying something judgmental and now i have a problem on my hands all year long whereas if i just say nothing and eh, they're a b employee they're always going to be a B employee. It's just not worth it for me to deal with this hassle. Well, I would say that's part of why we take change management so seriously, recognizing not everybody is going to be good at this initially. So to get over that fear factor, um, there's also, you know, obviously there's training that goes in associated with this um, and guidelines that guide uh, managers so that if they have that sort of fear factor that they can be, you know, shedding that over time. Um, but we work with our customers to do a comprehensive program design that allows for this kind of support and, you know, training strategies so that, you know, it's not all magically going to happen day one, go live. But we actually have a coaching class that we teach managers as well. And we will continue to expand on capabilities. As an example, Eric, we use analytics in the product to give HR insights into where the product is being used and not being used. Or is a manager not having these conversations? Are they not creating goals with their employees? So you can help them dive in where they might need the HR dive in with the manager saying, you seem to be having some difficulty getting this program up and communicating with your folks. Let's talk about maybe getting you some training. And on the other hand, not everybody's meant to be a manager to your earlier point. You know, I certainly saw it in my my career where we took the best salesperson we had and made him the manager. And they were, I call it the seventh rep syndrome. They weren't the manager. They were doing repping for the reps. You know, they weren't leading. And I used to say to people, you've been doing this job for 90 days. What are you doing differently today than you did 90 days ago? And a lot of times they're like, I'm doing exactly the same thing. <laughs> and that means they're in the wrong job. What, what parts of the book did you know, got left on the cutting room floor, got edited out that you're like, I, I really need to put this back in or I need a sequel to the book that everyone needs to hear this part. 
Well, you know, we had this balance of trying to um, poke the bear, if you will. You know, it, it is pretty amazing that a you know, 100-year-old process built by the U.S. Army, 70, made popular by GE and Jack Welsh, that people are still doing it, knowing it doesn't change performance, that we were calling out a few people, and, you know, that would have looked a little more attackish than it should have for an HR book. And so a few of those made it to the cutting room floor. You know, we left a couple of examples in there, but, you know, there's many. And, and I kind of think about it like the Internet when it came around and borders didn't think that was a threat and they no longer exist. You know, I, I think people need to move off these old processes because they're going to lose people who don't want to be spoken to once a year. Jamie, anything uh, that you yeah, wish to get out of that? Well, yes, because, you know, the whole conversation we've been having is how to, this is a challenge, right? This is, this is time to shake the trees and to take the challenge of transformation. And so there were probably, you know, we, we want to be respectfully challenging to our audience to say, you know what, this is possible. We have a lot of stories in the book of other companies who've done it. So it's not just something that we've concocted and have, you know, been successful in, um, and, you know, I think we still managed to poke the bear, as Doug says. All the layoffs going on in the tech sector right now, major companies, you know, the small ones, the big ones, the ones in between, and some of them have done them politely, nicely, with respect, with empathy. Some of them have done it very poorly and have upset their employees, the ones that they kept, the ones that they got rid of, on all sides of it. Are there companies that you look to in particular say, I respect how they did this, even though they had to make some difficult decisions on the flip side? Can you poke the bear and name a company where you said they did this particularly bad? Well, again, the, the, you're, you're very accurate, Eric. The gambit is wide, um, you know, uh, and I think it goes to leadership. I, I mean, this is all about the experience of a CEO, the experience of the HR person by the CEO side, the experience of the board of directors by the CEO side, and some of them who just weren't empathetic about this and saw more the need to save cash right now and lay people off over email or Zoom is very, you know, cold. And, and, and people are people. And I think those CEOs that treat and understand that people are the most important asset in their company do it with respect. And you've seen a bunch of those do it really well. And people even have said, you know, that wasn't, I, I didn't like the experience, but it was a good one for me. And I enjoyed being at this company. And then you see all the hate going on in companies that are doing it poorly. What do you think, Jamie? Uh, I would totally agree. And th the only thing I would add is um, that people, that those, the, the way that a company acts, uh, whether bad uh, or good, is something that employers new sorry new employees are looking to when they're making decisions about where they're going to work next true true because you know at some point it'll happen right and and you want to be in a place that shows that that respectfulness yeah uh, this this is a good one makeworkbetter.com obviously for people that want to read it want to know more better works is the company i'm, I'm impressed you got makeworkbetter.com because it's like you can't even get a good url these days so i don't know whose arm you had to twist to get that <laughs> we, we did have to twist one arm to get it and it wasn't uh it, it wasn't very expensive let's put it. <laughs> i'm excited to see how this conversation this narrative because this is obviously a big one right this affects everybody everyone who's had a job has a job will have a job this affects them right it affects their yeah. lives their families i'm excited to see where this narrative goes where the conversation goes as more people enter that dialogue like what how that debate is structured and what changes we're going to see and it does remind me you know like i work differently than my parents worked my kids who are very little will work differently than how i work but i can't envision yet what that will look like right you couldn't have envisioned 30 years ago that we would all just be on a computer working from home right that wasn't a thing when i was a kid so who knows what it will be a generation from now and it starts with a lot of these these hr processes right like how do we respect individuals how does their boss treat them what is the nature of their work and how do we measure that work and, and what they expect from work has really changed as well. And I would say that, you know, although we don't have a crystal ball, I, what I hope for your children, Eric, is that they are in a work environment that allows them to thrive and not be thwarted. And that's exactly what we're trying to do here, set that uh, environment. Exactly. And 
you know, and I'll end in a second, but so many people I know that they went to great colleges, they did all the right things, but all of a sudden they're at this great big name company, but the job itself is thwarting them. And it's like, oh, where did I go wrong here? Right. Because the job has so much psychological impact on their lives. Like I did all these things on paper and now I've got the wrong manager. I've got the wrong process here and I don't know how to get out of it. Right. Well, and you know, we, there's some wonderful tools now for people to understand what is truly the culture of a company prior to going there. Exactly. You know? Exactly. Things like last door. Yep. Exactly. So Doug, Jamie, I appreciate the time. This certainly opened my eyes a little bit on you know, thinking about the way I'm working and, and who I'm working with and all that. This is great. So makeworkbetter.com, get all the information about the book. Better Works is the company. And uh, thank you again. Appreciate thank your time. You. Thank you to my guest and thanks for listening. Subscribe to get the latest episodes each week and we'll see you next time.